first thing I want to do, of course, is to express my gratitude to Clara and Fatima and Louise and the whole team for having invited me to this challenge, which is to talk a little bit to you on an environment which is about computation. And this is a challenge because I know very, very, very little about computation. I know a little more now, uh, since I've been hanging out for the last few days and listening to some quite interesting talks and uh, speaking occasionally during the coffee breaks with some of you. But I still know very little, and I'm, I'm, I'm actually deeply aware of uh, the handicap to begin with. Um, the challenge that was originally proposed to me was an interesting one, and this is why I agreed to accept. Um, the challenge was to instigate uh, possibilities that would lead from uh, your own disciplines, your own universes of interest and research into this more hands-on approach that is expected with the hackathon. So I said, okay, well, under those conditions, sure, I would love to say a few things and see where it goes. Having said this, I still think that whatever's going to happen in the next hour or so, I, I believe we have until eight, right? So feel free to leave if, you, if I ramble on for too long. But part of what's going to happen it will involve your participation. And actually, at one point, I will explicitly um, invite you to participate in a small exercise that I think would also contribute eventually to that kind of stirring up of ideas and possibilities that have been required to uh, somehow instigate. Now, as you probably know, if you've looked at the program, this was scheduled for 6.30 p.m., but it was also called Mind the Future on how we predict the unpredictable. And my original idea um, regarding this talk was to mainly focus um, on how my own areas of scientific expertise, i.e. design uh, new media, and to a certain extent crossing with semiotics and philosophy, understanding and unraveling how these disciplines tend to handle this notion of the future. Um, on the assumption, on the general assumption that a lot of this prediction actually has to do more with expectations, projections, and even superstition than an actual rigorous prediction. The thing is, for the last three days, and listening to you whenever I was able to make it, I have become more and more aware that in your own disciplines, you're probably making a much better job at understanding what's coming next. I think, well, part of it is probably due to your own merit, of course. Part of it is surely down to the discipline itself and how it can um, itself base um, uh, their, uh, its principles on certain kinds of uh, indicators which are a lot more rigorous than the ones that we use in humanities and social sciences, which tend themselves to be um, relatively subjective. This in itself is a subjective statement. But really, all of this to say that I've been, in the last few days, pretty, I would say, humbled by the ability of a lot of you to indeed envision what might come next from your own perspective, and I would say as far as technologies and hard sciences go. But the thing is that my main point here would have been to address this kind of frequent failure in envisioning the full impact of these um, emerging technologies when it comes to uh, what they actually do in our social cultural environment. We haven't been very good at predicting the kinds of um, not so beneficial uh, outcomes of certain applications that we've been putting out into the world. Um, so really, my original point was to invite you to reflect on how we can do a better job at what I would call embracing the unpredictable. 
Um, it's not just me saying this, but it's also one of our uh, dearest contemporary thinkers called Franco Berardi, who argues that it's actually quite important to be open to the evidence and the inevitability that the future is just not going to be what we expect. Meanwhile, and because I've been listening to you, the first shift, my first, let's say, um, unexpected realization, something I didn't predict myself, was that it would probably make a lot more sense to adjust slightly the perspective of what I wanted to share with you. And rather than making it strictly about the future and how we've been attempting to predict what's coming up in the next 50 years, how will computers be in 2068, rather than doing that exercise, I thought, wait, wait a minute, what, what about if we bring the future into what's happening right now? Because actually, that's what we're being proposed largely, is that we can only understand the present if we keep projecting ourselves into something that's coming next. And I believe one of our challenges these days is to actually challenge this principle itself. And the maybe growing difficulty that we've been feeling in actually living and embracing the present without, let's say, being kind of kept in this constant state of neurosis on, okay, what next, what next, what's the next trend, what's the next technology, what's the next development? What about now? What about, what are computers doing in 2018? So with apologies to the organization, I decided to speak about the present instead. Now, this is a risk for me too, because I, I'm just as puzzled as you probably are with regards to what's going on in the world right now. And I ask for your understanding or even compassion in advance, because I did bring some ideas. Uh, I drafted a structure to these ideas, but they are fundamentally intuitive thoughts that I think and I hope might be useful to some of us, to all of us, and if everything else fails, they might be useful to myself. So let's see what happens. Be compassionate and benevolent. If not, I hope you get something out of it, even if it's, let's say, an antidote of some kind. So what I decided to bring here is really this first change this new title on technological development and fundamentally I'm interested, even as a researcher, in understanding um, how this technology that we're uh, handling in 2018 is actually having an impact on all kinds of different semantic layers that we inhabit. And it was actually really, really interesting to listen to the previous speaker use the word semantic in, a, in, a, in an environment and in a context and in a kind of a, a meaning that was truly new to me. Because within my own area of study, when we speak of semantics, we're fundamentally speaking about linguistics, we're fundamentally speaking about philosophy, and we're fundamentally speaking about culture and communication. That's really when I'm co where I'm coming from, and it's also an assumption um, that I would invite you to embrace um, during the next half hour or the next hour or so. Also, as a means of introduction, I thought it would be useful to tell you a little bit about the media lab that I'm currently directing or coordinating. It's called Unexpected Media. And again, it stems from this belief or this evidence that there's a lot of issues that pertain to the cultural and social impacts or even the existential impact, if you want to take it a bit further, of the kinds of media that we've been developing, perfecting, and commercializing throughout the world. Our research uh, group is fundamentally interested in this binary uh, dynamic that you have here. On one hand, 
we're keeping an eye or a finger on the pulse of technology that is emerging, showing up. And we propose to keep it in check and hopefully envision the kinds of challenges, even dangers that some of it may propose or um, contain, to be more exact. On the other hand, the word unexpected for us signals the importance of honoring heritage. Because we believe that in recent years, we've been quite good at discarding certain kinds of media simply because, hey, there's something new coming. The new iPhone is coming, so queue up and, uh, you know, it's got some kind of uh, cute uh, new function. So we kind of need it, don't we? Possibly not. Of course, I don't want to diss the iPhone, and by all means, I'm a user of smartphones, probably such as yourselves. But on the other hand, what we would like to do is to look into the media that we're discarding and asking a very simple question, which is, is it time to bury it? Or can it still play a different kind of role? And we'll address that a bit later. Now, some of the things that have become clearer to me throughout the last few days while listening to you and talking to you is that technology and the hard sciences that precede it have been very good at creating certain kinds of channels that I call endpoints that bring the research that you yourselves are doing into the larger and the broader world as hopeful benefits. Because as researchers, I think we all agree that we're fundamentally here to, and excuse the cliche, to make, make the world a better place. One of the endpoints that I've identified, and I think it's been actually, again, quite clear this afternoon, is health. So, that's a damn good idea to use our research in order to help us all live a healthier life. One other endpoint that maybe hasn't been so explicitly present, at least not in the sessions that I've been able to attend, but I think we can and should keep on the radar, is entertainment. And as we know, a lot of technology has been investing um, commercially in the entertainment industry. But I propose also is that we don't just translate the word entertainment as video games, but we take a broader perspective whereby a lot of the activities that we see um, these days even being called and considered information, news, is probably somehow enmeshed also in this context of entertainment. And a third one that I'll propose for now is this idea of freedom. Um, the idea that technology is going to emancipate us. It's going to emancipate us from burdensome tasks. It's going to emancipate us from any kind of constraint that we may have in our daily lives or maybe in a more existential level. And it's going to help us express ourselves. It's something that's going on these days, also one of those buzz expressions that seems to be quite popular. Express yourself. But of course the question is, what do I have to express? Do I actually have something to express? Or given the kind of technology, media and expectations that are associated with these media, Am I fundamentally going to be replicating what is already out there? When I share a content on, sense, on, on um, social media, am I indeed sharing something? Or am I fundamentally acting as an echo chamber? So what exactly does it mean when we hear the technology is going to bring us freedom? That's something that I would like us to reflect on, too. 
Now, back to the future, as the film says. And Louise and Clara and I had some interesting conversations on the preparation of this event, and um, um, on their part, I got very useful advice on the expectations of my own talk. Um, and the word future was one of the hot words that we kind of ground to the ground and uh, wouldn't really let it go. Because, again, as I said in the beginning, the word future hasn't been so much lately about a rigorous prediction of what's coming next, as much as it has been playing a role in our own state of expectation, anxiety, prediction, and we'll see it a bit later, I call it superstition. It's really remarkable, I don't know, I mean, we've got quite a few countries here, we've got a, people coming from other places in Portugal, not just Porto, but just to give you an example of how the concept of future has been so popular in the city of Porto in the last few years, well, you have the future of computing going on right now, but not so long ago we have this entrepreneurship uh, fair, Feira do Empreendedorismo, where the motto was experience the future. And apparently experiencing the future involves an entrepreneur being hijacked by a UFO. Um, whether that sounds good or not, I'll leave it up to you. Whether the entrepreneur enjoys that, probably, because the idea is to bring them over to the Feira do Empreendedorismo, and uh, somehow uh, that's what the image promises, come to entrepreneurship uh, uh, summit and be hijacked by the UFOs, experience the future. The UFO, of course, also as a symbol of the unknown, which is, again, a very, very interesting point, because on one hand, we do want to decipher the future, but on the other hand, this concept of the unknown is also something very, very dear to us, exploring the unknown, going beyond our own borders, our own frontiers, our own limitations. We've also had a summit by a project called Future Cities, and uh, the project promised something or, or declared something very, very interesting, which is the future is already here. So we go to this concept um, that was proposed um, about 20 years ago, time-space compression. The future is already here. What does that mean? That we're suddenly unable to see next. It's a future becomes the present because we're no longer available to actually live and experience the present, then what? What comes after the future if the future is already here? So Porto is sold often as a traditional city, slightly melancholic, very touristy because of that, you know, it's kind of a trip to the past, you come and stroll the old streets of the old city and you enjoy the charms of how it used to be. But on the other hand, Porto wants to position itself as a city of the future. So it has forums where we discuss what's coming next, Forum do Futuro. And now I would say I'm guilty of it myself because I created this Media Lab Digital Media Festival in 2008 called Future Places. If only I knew, right? I would say at this point, if I could go back, I would have changed the name. Not because I have anything against the future or discussing the future, but because I think this whole neurosis about predicting what's coming next is becoming a bit overcrowded. So we've done actually something about future places since the first edition in 2008. We changed the aesthetics, look at the original poster and how really the image that accompanies the name of the Media Lab is so austere but also so deterministic. It's the image of a building in Austin, Texas. And 
the original idea was that we were somehow following the North American paradigm and that we would like to bring that kind of certainty into our context here. Of course, we were young and naive, and we don't mean to put down the US paradigm, at least not in this particular instance. But on the other hand, over time, we came to realize that the key word here was places, and that what we were doing was actually a lot more important when it was tied to location. In this case, the city of Porto, which is not in the United States of America. The future then, and after all these examples, and because I've been interested, why are so, people so obsessed with events about the future? Well, one, of the, one idea that came to me was that really we're very, very interesting, interested in two other concepts which derive from this projector into the future, which is, on one hand, the concept of utopia. We all want a better future. We all want to contribute to a better future. But on the other hand, there's something going on in the air, and very media-fueled often, which tends to be catastrophic in its uh, outline. And we're kind of left in between, shifting between the two, and actually often living both simultaneously. We want to believe that tomorrow will be better than today, but we open the headlines and we go, oh my God, not again. So what do we do? Well, what we did at Future Places was to explode the whole deterministic myth, and this is the poster for edition nine from two years ago. And as you can see, we've come a long, long way. And what we've done here was, on one hand, to signal the fact that we're no longer living in an era where a single paradigm is possible. What we're also signaling here is that despite that impossibility, there is still a determinism going on, which is often strangely and perversely disguised as the freedom that I was talking about a little while ago. So we decided to do something else with the word future on this poster, which was to completely fill it out with noise. We superimposed the designation of our Media Lab Future Places, the typefaces that we've used throughout all the editions, and we left this kind of a very, very noisy ghost-like presence that is still barely readable. But we thought, let's make this a statement in itself. Because on one hand, there's another paradox that we leave uh, open-ended on every edition. We say, everyone is welcome. Look at the top right. If you can't understand Portuguese, todos bem-vindos, that's what it means. Come on over, come in for a ride. On the other hand, we are and have been firm believers that numbers don't necessarily mean a better experience. So we walk that tightrope between, of course, wanting the Media Lab to be successful, but on the other hand, believing that we can only do half of the work. The other half needs to be done by whomever decides to join us. And in this case, the first challenge was to describe what the hell we're called. So enough about the future for the time being, because I said I would be speaking about the present. And what I would like to present to you is fundamentally what I see as five possible entry points for what I call a mindful social cultural impact of technology and the hard sciences. And I truly hope that in the middle of everything that I'm going to be presenting next, 
some of this will be useful to the hackathon as instructed, or at least some of it will be useful for further reflection. Can you hear me okay like this, or do I need to keep holding it? No? Fantastic, thank you, Ender. So five entry points I propose, and I'll explain them with some examples. You can read them here. And the fifth one is going to involve your participation, your help. So take a deep breath, because you will be recruited in a few minutes. The first entry point that I propose is called incorporating history and mythology. There's a pattern throughout history when it comes to certain kinds of phenomena. And it's important for us to, every now and then, remember them and establish parallels, which sometimes are very obvious, sometimes not so obvious, but still there are opportunities for us to understand a bit better what might happen as a consequence of what we're giving to the world. Uh, three examples I believe I brought to you. One of them is a very straightforward one. Does anyone remember this for, um, from a few months ago? A little app called Snap Heal. It appeared as um, a sidebar advertising on social media and email, and it proposed a very simple exercise, which was possibility of erasing objects and people from your photos. So whatever you didn't want in your photos, you just apply Snap Hill and through some kind of, uh, I don't know, I would assume algorithmic reading of the environment, you'd be magically rid of this, in this case, of this ladder. Now, it's quite interesting that it's a ladder that in this particular example people want to get rid of because in the absence of a ladder, people start floating and they start defying gravity. In other words, we start emancipating ourselves from our own physical, anatomical, biological constraints, even though it's simply an exercise in simulation. It's cute, you know, you're laughing, that's good, yeah. Gets even weirder, doesn't it, you know, whoa. This is me trying to uh, organize my thoughts into this lecture, possibly. You, know. you can even erase people completely. Notice the pencil as a metaphor for the digital erasing. It's quite interesting. Now, I would say it's not very difficult to understand why I'm picking up on this example and thus in inviting you, challenging you to remember history in this case. Because as we know, there are regimes throughout the world and throughout history and in the present day who regularly erase people from public memory and public records whenever these people are not convenient to the regimes. And you can say, and you're right, yeah, but this is just kind of like a cute thing that we can do to our photos. Fair enough. But please don't tell me there is no connection. Because there is a connection. So look at history when attempting to understand what kinds of potential impacts these technologies might have. And you might just might find some interesting points where things connect unexpectedly. The second example, I hope, will bring a few smiles to some of the faces of those present. If they're in my age group, does anyone remember this? Yeah. All right. What was Space 1999? Well, Space 1999 was a TV series. It was a response um, to Star Trek, an attempt to make a more kind of a philosophical version of Star Trek was slightly less action-based and more kind of uh, involving in a philosophical way. The premise was simple. There was a, um, um, a scientific base operating on the moon, moon base Alpha, and one beautiful day, uh, a huge nuclear explosion actually propelled the moon out of the orbit of the Earth. 
And the rest of the series was an absolutely beautiful journey whereby the moon would just kind of drift through the universe and find these most, these most amazing realities, creatures, challenges, and God knows what else. One particular episode, I think, was somehow engraved in everyone's mind in our generation. It was called The Bringers of Wonder. Hmm. You know what I'm talking about. The Bringers of Wonder had an amazing premise. You see these monstrous creatures. These creatures had landed on Moon, moon Base Alpha and had hypnotized the whole crew. So the whole crew thought that they were looking at their loved ones who had somehow been able to come from planet Earth to rescue them back. That's what they saw, their loved ones. What these creatures wanted, actually, they wanted the hypnotized crew to provoke a nuclear explosion that they would use as food because they fed on nuclear energy. And while in this trance, the expectation was, of course, that the crew would perish, but would perish happy because they thought they had been brought back to Earth and their loved ones. And this, philosophically speaking, was an incredible dilemma. I remember being quite young and somehow getting it, you know. Would it be better for them to open their eyes and see the absolute horror of what was going on? Or would it be better for them to die happy under the illusion that they had gone home and hugged their loved ones again? So this is mythology. These are the fundamental dilemmas that we as human beings face. And maybe, just maybe, a bit of popular culture from our childhood or youth can also be an interesting place for us to revisit and draw some conclusions on the current state of media compulsion and sometimes hallucination. The last example that I bring when I suggest that we can incorporate history and mythology is, of course, punk. Not so distant, but we can't get rid of the word future, can we? Even if we're just using it as a declaration of impossibility. But of course, what we need to understand when it comes to punk is that they were using this expression or declaration, no future, as a radical statement to affirm something which wasn't quite as straightforward. What punk was saying was, we don't want the future that you're preparing to us. We want a different one, not this future. And this is how we need to understand what punk was proposing. Which leads me, of course, to the next topic, topic, which is the firm belief that the words that we've been using and the words that have been used often these days to sell the developments that we see and their impact that they've been having in the world, these words are somehow being alienated and often turned into something else they don't quite mean. But because we tend to regard these words as so self-evident, we just go along. And before we know it, we've said yes to something that is the absolute opposite of what we wanted. I'll give you some examples. Is there dogma in these words? We've spoken enough about the future. I don't think I have anything else about the future left, so let's leave it alone. Faster, the concept of faster. The other day, I got a call from my phone provider, Nosh, and they were trying to sell me faster internet and more TV channels. And I took a deep breath. Oh, God, I'm going to get rid of this. And then I realized, yeah, I know how I'm going to handle this situation. And I said, look, can you slow down my internet a little bit? It's actually a bit too fast. And can you actually take some TV channels away? Because, you know, too many, I can't choose. Um, the lady on the other 
side of the phone line said, I'm sorry, Mr. Allfellows, I don't think we can accommodate your wish. And she hung up. It short-circuited the experience. It was really, really interesting. Why did this happen? Because the automatic expectation is that we all want faster and more. Because it's cool to have faster internet and more stuff. Right. Why? Other examples. Of course, the word smart. Smart technology, smart cities, smart uh, everything. To what point when we provide the world with all of this smart stuff, aren't we delegating our own skills and as a consequence losing our own capacities and as a consequence becoming less smart ourselves, our sense of orientation, our ability to interact in healthy ways. And by no means am I trying to put down the amazing work that is being done that I use myself. Here I am with a laptop, with a smartphone on my bag, with a GPS in my car. But again, I try to use these things mindfully. You should have seen the face of the kid that sold me the phone when I said, can you switch off the internet on the phone? But it's free. Yeah, switch it off. Okay. So again, freedom, free. Free time is also an interesting concept. We're being promised free time, right? Delegating all these functions so we can have more free time to do our own stuff. The problem is if I keep delegating, I will reach a point in which I will no longer have anything to do. Pretty soon, there will be some kind of smart technology that listens to the music that I want to listen to, so I'll have more free time to do my stuff. I don't need to listen to music anymore. I think we're reaching that point pretty soon. The idea of community, we'll see that a bit later. Are we talking about communities, online communities? Sometimes we are. And I don't, again, don't want to put down the amazing things that have happened as a consequence of online interaction that I haven't did made a difference. But on the other hand, it's good for us to distinguish what indeed has been communal work and what is simply being called a community while simply being a statistical kind of phenomenon. So I've spoken about more, and then uh, again, Mark Zuckerberg's favorite slogan, which is bringing people together. And I would argue it's getting a bit crowded. The latest one, of course, is we care about your privacy. No, we don't. We're just being forced to do this. Just as you've probably seen this, and this relates to the idea of delegating our functions so that we can have more free time. There was a demo recently which made a huge success in some uh, conferences dedicated to these kinds of technology, where the um, Google Assistant handled complicated conversations. They said, adding even small little human hints that made the conversation sound natural. So the virtual assistant, when um, reserving a table for you at a restaurant, would say some things such as, um, can you um, please reserve um, a table, please? Um, you don't have it for that time? Well, uh, so the idea that all of a sudden technology itself can sound like it's hesitating for me is incredibly interesting. And again, it's great, isn't it? Because you're going to have free time for yourself, right? What the hell is wrong with making a call to a restaurant and booking a table? Can someone explain to me? So to end this idea on, of language, I just propose that maybe, just maybe, part of our linguistic exercises these days are, is actually acting as a mechanism of paralysis of action. You can see that readily on social media, what I called a few years ago, wishful activism. You like certain causes, you see something wrong in the world, you put like or an angry face, and you move on and you feel better about yourself. But then again, that's nothing new. We've, we're aware of this. Let's just keep it in mind, because I don't think it's going to get better anytime soon.
I propose a small reflection, a short reflection on the idea of distance and scarcity. And it kind of goes back to some of the things that I've um, referred to already, but let's bring it back for a second and how Zuckerberg so optimistically says that Facebook's mission is fundamentally bringing the world closer together. I mean, we do need connections. Um, God knows Facebook has been helpful for me to reconnect with some people that have made a difference in my life, and I more than welcome their return. But on the other hand, this idea that we need to be constantly available, um, and that's the expectation of our constant mutual presence, does that take away something from us? In this case, does distance have a role to play? And quite a few contemporary philosophers say yes. Byung Chul Han is one of them. Andrew Keenan is another one. They proclaim fundamentally that distance is a need, a human need, and it's fundamentally the mother of reflection and introspection. And I see a younger generation which is not necessarily handling the idea of time off very easily, because also, as we know, a lot of these media and technologies are quite addictive and compulsive. Scarcity, I think, is also a good word. Let's bring it in. I remember being a, a young kid in Portugal before we joined the European Union. Music was really, really hard to come across. We relied on national releases, and we, if, we, if we wanted to open up a bit to whatever else was going on in the world, I think our choice was basically down to ABBA, the Bee Gees, Supertramp, and the Rolling Stones, and the Pink Floyd. That was it. Right. And that's fine, you know, these are all great bands, pop bands, and rock bands. But what I want to point out here was how absolutely delighted we were when one of us happened to go abroad for some reason, on vacation with their parents, whatever, and they brought a couple of LPs that we duly copied on cassette tapes, and we just scrutinized every lyric for the next half year. And we learned every inflection. We understood what was trying to be said. We interpreted, we incorporated what was being said on every single word of those albums for, the, for months on end and um, endless nights filled with beer. And it's really interesting to see ourselves on, at the opposite end of this spectrum of possibility, where right now, you know, our phone provides every possible soundtrack we might dream of or imagine. And I don't know about you, but sometimes I just don't know what to choose anymore, so I choose silence. And then I realize that actually it sounds really good. On to the fourth one, semiotic decipherment. It's a simple principle that I apply myself to my daily life, and I invite you to try it out. It's fun, and apart from being fun, it's also quite useful. Look around. A lot of your daily life is filled with possible metaphors. This image that you saw was taken in London a few years ago at low tide of the River Thames. Low tide at the River Thames is really fun because uh, a lot of objects just show up, right? Uh, Mark Dion, a Canadian artist, did an amazing exhibition uh, about 20 years ago where he just exhibited tons of objects that um, he excavated, he and his team, team excavated out of the Thames on the low tide, which included prosthetic limbs. You find prosthetic limbs at the River Thames. Someone actually threw out a prosthetic limbs, prosthetic limbs into the River Thames. So it's just amazing, you know, the history and the stories that you can kind of guess out of these objects. And in this case, someone threw a shopping cart into the river. How and why, God knows. But suddenly, isn't it just a beautiful image to kind of reflect this state of exhaustion that we've reached in the culture of consumption that we're inhabiting. 
And then this morning, something interesting happened in this semiotic decipherment. I thought my presentation was ready when Facebook itself presented me with the greatest example that I could have asked for. It's actually a bit scary, if you ask me. And it allows me to bring the idea of superstition. We don't quite know what's going on. And a lot of us, at least in the humanities and social sciences, are struggling to understand this whole universe of black box algorithms that somehow seem to get it right, seem to know what we want, seem to know where we are, seem to know our expectations and our innermost desires. Facebook presented me with this video this morning. And the video was remarkable. We're going to see it in a minute, right? Facebook said, uh, what we do together matters. Matters to whom? I don't know. Right? It's the little things we do together and for each other that make community matter. So far, so good. From all of us at Facebook, I think they're talking about robots, here's a video celebrating how you and your community are better together. The scary part, well, there's many scary parts, but the first scary part is that this image that you see here, that Facebook chose, was taken in this very stage. Now, is this a coincidence? <laughs> I don't know, but stranger things are coming, so brace yourselves. <laughs> Bad soundtrack, that's the other thing. That's me at UP Tech, surrounded by a forest, a random forest. This is a catalog from 1987 in Coimbra that I scanned and shared. And suddenly there's just random kids holding it like stuff, right? I didn't know this. <laughs> and I'll be speaking with this gentleman tomorrow. I'll be giving a lecture with that guy tomorrow. How did they know? I don't know what this is. And we're back to the stage. Bloody hell. So you probably, some of you know what, what's going on here and how Facebook picked on the same exact place where I'm sitting right now and how Facebook understood and put in this slideshow the context that I'll be uh, in tomorrow speaking with Jose uh, Pesek Preda. But for me, this is pure magic, of course. It's just that kind of thing that makes you go, oh my God, right? Serendipity to the extreme. But again, the other thing that you can see on this video, which I don't find quite as enticing, is the mixing up of random slogans. Community means a lot. What the hell is that supposed to mean anyway? And the mixing up of my own, this is not my image, 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 this is my image, not my image, not my image, not my image, my image held by kids that I have no idea who they are, not my image. So what's what exactly is the point, right? And it's really interesting, and going back to the point of lexical alienation, how all of these words, right? Meaning, community, meaning. I'm watching a meaningless video, I'm sorry. There's no meaning behind this, there's nothing. Just stuff. So I know I promised not to speak about the future, but here it comes again. And I don't want to speak about brands. I don't want to diss Facebook. I don't want to diss Vodafone. That's not really the point. I have nothing against these companies, and I do believe that they, are, they mean well, or some of them do. I'm just interested in the semiotic decipherment that I was talking about. And in this case, Vodafone proposes that the future is amazing. Yeah, but what is it? I don't know, but it's amazing. 
So we go back to this idea of utopia. You know, there's an element of faith here, right? And the young girl looks at this cute little robot, which is interestingly enough holding a pencil. <laughs> and look at how passively, passively gazing she is. She's just staring at the wonders of technology and what they can do. She's delegated, of course, her ability to draw into this little machine. Isn't it wonderful? Or if you want another example, and of course I took out the Vodafone logo, thank you very much, just in case. Um, this is Porto, two weeks ago, Trindade station, metro station. And there's this gigantic poster where this uh, gentleman wearing some uh, futuristic clothes is also clearly in the future, wearing some virtual reality gear, is about to be eaten by a dinosaur. I didn't know there were dinosaurs in the future, but hey, welcome back. <laughs> two, two interesting things about this image, um, and again, inviting you to this semiotic decipherment. The shop at the bottom of this building is a pharmacy, which might come in handy if the dinosaur fulfills its wishes. The second thing that I find interesting is how entertainment is inviting us to feel these strong kinds of uh, emotions um, by wearing VR glasses that simulate being eaten by a dinosaur, when actually all it takes is just really opening the news. And you're pretty much eaten alive by reptiles. That's how geopolitics is going these days, isn't it? Every time I read these words, I brace myself these days, and I mean it. So thanks, I don't need the freaking dinosaur. We've got enough of them as it goes. Semiotic decipherment, when systems fail, it's really interesting to watch, you know? This is um, some kind of Portuguese public service, I think, uh, finances, right? And the system was down, as sometimes the system goes, you know, system's down. It's really interesting, because when people say the system is down, people go, oh, okay, end of the story. So, you know, imagine that I couldn't make it to this conference. I could just say, well, the system is down. That's it. Enough of an explanation. But see how wonderfully people improvise a solution to it, right? There are four types of services being provided. One is green, um, the other is pink, the other is blue, and the other is white. So you take the respective color with a number, which is duly explained here, the purpose of each color, and you wait for your turn to be called. Bingo! Guess what? It works! <laughs> Just as this marvelous interactive table worked really well at the National Scientific uh, Summit in 2016. It's about to happen in Lisbon next week. You're most welcome to attend. So it's a touch screen, touch screen where you can check the program and navigate through the map of the building and all that. People just used it to put down their uh, soup um, once they were done with it. Is there anyone paying attention? Is there anyone looking and thinking, okay, maybe that's not as useful as we thought. Maybe that investment didn't really pay off. Semiotic decipherment, of course, also invites us to look at numbers. And we go back to an obsession that I've already mentioned, numbers. <laughs> more, 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 more is better, right? So you remember a couple of years ago when Trump said, we've had the biggest inauguration ever. Okay, well, Obama had a bigger one, as we say, but hey, how about Queen and Pink Floyd? How about your carpet? It's all a question of scale, isn't it? Until you reach a point in which, of course, overabundance becomes meaningless. And you're left with something quite precious, which is the absence of a TV signal. Which is interesting because the absence of a TV signal no longer looks like this, right? This is analog signal. Now the absence of a TV signal is blue. Why? Because this is too harsh for our fluffy selves. We can't handle sudden noises and weird kind of uh, patterns and textures, or can we? 
So as a conclusion of this first part, and I'm probably, well, I'm not doing so bad after all. Um, as a conclusion for this part, um, my last proposal is consider the possibility of, of, of re-inscribing dead media um, in the work that, that we're doing. And not necessarily as a kind of act of nostalgia whereby you resurrect some kind of uh, technology for the sake of uh, being a nerd. Although, by all means, if you want to do that, do it. I mean, I still have three turntables and two cassette decks, and I use them, and I love them. Uh, but I'm also positing the possibility that maybe the endpoint for dead media, in other words, the media we've left behind, doesn't necessarily have to be a niche or a Facebook community, as Zuckerberg would say, but it can actually be an opportunity for us to consider the way we're handling reality in very, very different ways. Reality, I would say, and we go back to prediction and to the unpredictable, always finds way of, ways of betraying our expectations to the point where social media that began as such a space for utopia, and all of us 10 years ago were praising the brave new world where everyone would just find harmony online. But we know what happened in the meantime. So, this is the end of part one. And in order to illustrate this proposal, reinventing that media as ritual metaphor, I would like to invite you for an exercise, which maybe just maybe will inspire people for the hackathon. If not, we've got nothing to lose, really. We're just killing time until 8 p.m. And believe me, Alvida is worth it. Just waiting for the projector to warm up. Patricia, can we get rid of these lights? Thanks. The, the ones in the middle. If not, that's fine. No big deal. So, what you see here is a bag. And it's an interesting bag because it connects with something that we've already seen, which is a, a pharmacy. The pharmacy itself, semiotically in this context, is a beautiful metaphor, the metaphor for healing, for whatever we need that will heal the pain, make us feel better, take away the symptoms, cure the illness. And I don't want to make this into any kind of grand statement, to be honest, it just kind of happened. I needed to bring in whatever's inside this bag, and I grabbed this, or, well, I, I grabbed this bag, which was sturdy enough, and then I looked at it and I thought, ah, what a nice coincidence. Furthermore, it's a, an American bag, it's an American pharmacy. So we were speaking about the US and how it's kind of leading certain geopolitical dilemmas that we're facing. Another interesting kind of decipherment. But what I'm most interested in doing right now is finding out what's inside this bag. We were talking about dead media. Any guesses? And if you know, please don't answer, because a few people know. What is the media that you can consider, remember, that is most likely possibly just not coming back? Vinyl is doing well these days. Cassette tapes are not bad either. There's a niche, there's a ton of Facebook groups. What's inside the spine? Anyone? Don't be afraid. Could have been floppy disks. What was the other? VCR. 
Like I don't even know what that is. Bingo. VHS tapes. There are 11 VHS tapes here. Right. And what I want to do with these tapes is a very, very simple exercise, which is for us to attempt to prove to Mark Zuckerberg that dead media can bring people closer together than Facebook. For that purpose, I would invite any of you who wish to join me on stage to join me on stage so we can get closer. As Zuckerberg likes. If you don't feel comfortable, that's fine. You don't have to. That's it? <laughs> Nobody else? Facebook wins? Last chance. <laughs> no, 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 never, never gonna win. Last chance? <laughs> Guys, it's gonna be fun, I promise you. Yes, thank you, Claudia. Very good. Okay, um, the, the floor is relatively clean, isn't it? Looks okay. good, looks good. Let's have a seat. Sure, Let's have a sure. seat. Let's sit down. You can still join us at any point. VHS, who said VHS? Who guessed it right? Fantastic, here's your prize. <laughs> now, what I'd like you to do is to open this VHS tape. I made your task easier. I remove the screws. <laughs> Just open it. There you go. What's inside? Uh, two, two reels. Two Great. So what we have inside of your chest tape is this, right? It's magnetic tape. Hang on to one of them. You know what to do, Claudia. <laughs> <laughs> Who would like a VHS tape? Pornography, most likely. <laughs> and as you receive a tape, stand up and start connecting people. <laughs> That's you, Claudia. And you, Andrea. The, the, the connector. Oh, you did, huh? <laughs> eh? Well, here's another one for you, then. Huh? Okay. Fatima. So uh, I'm destroying the microphone. <laughs> Stand up. It's going to take us until 8, easily. Yes. Move around, guys. Exactly. Exactly. Clara. <laughs> Careful with the neck. Careful with the neck. Don't do the neck. The neck is dangerous. It's not worth it. Oh, 
Let me put one. Can you hold it? Thank you. Lá em cima. Can you help us? Thank you very much, everyone. I would like to say a few things. First of all, thank you so much to those who agreed to participate. I hope it was an enjoyable moment. I see a lot of smiles. That's always a good thing. Um, the second thing that I would like to point out is that this is by no means an exercise in absurdity. Of course, there's an element of Dadaism. And if you know a bit of art history, you know that there is a tradition of these kinds of performances and impromptu actions where people get involved and explore the possibilities for the simple joy of it. Right? Um, that's, I would say, not to be underestimated. And it shouldn't be confused with just being silly and a bit out of it. Right? Of course, there's a way of looking at it. You know, what exactly were we doing and why? Well, I don't know, but I can I ask the same exact question when I'm scrolling on Facebook. Why am I doing this? And I don't really have an answer either. Right? So my point here, really, is that we can and should reconsider certain kinds of materials, tools, devices that are part of our heritage and resurrect them not necessarily as technology, but as source material, in this case, for a ritual that we just kind of decided to rehearse. Uh, what I would invite everyone to do, and again, this is just happening, so I'm also improvising myself, but maybe as a final statement, we could just bring all the tape back as a kind of a sculpture that remains there. And you carefully untangle yourselves, because we don't want any strangled necks. Right? And just whatever's up there, bring it back. Bring it all here. Make yes. a pile of it. Make a pile of it. Ah! 
The rise of anti fluffy. Anti fluffy limbs. <laughs> Gostava para terminar de convidar os meus distintos anfitriões. I would like to invite my, my uh, distinguished hosts as a token of gratitude for this possibility to join me in wearing the new anti fluffy costume for a photo. <laughs> Fatima. Don't be shy, Louis. Okay. Hold on. <laughs> but yeah, if anyone would like to join, please uh, do. By the way, the, the My Fair Lady tape, <laughs> I want it back again. <laughs> <laughs> All right, is the portrait done? Nelson. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> too hot, too hot. Yeah. Whoa. Thank you. So cool. I think that's it. Thank you so much.